Hello everyone and good evening. Uh, well, today I'm talking about a topic which has not only research significance, but which has personal relevance for me as well. I grew up in a country where the kind of education that I'm talking about, I am a product of that education. And I have experienced all the conflict that I'm going to mention in this presentation. So it's not just a kind of a mental curiosity because of which I am presenting all this, but it is something that I have experienced and I have experienced it very recently in 2008 when there was a huge military operation in the, in the area after the Taliban took over for a brief time and then they were overthrown. So I have, I have titled my topic A Tug of Words because this is what is going on. There is a conflict along the educational fault line. And I like to put this in perspective by mentioning the highly controversial and best-selling book of Samuel Huntington, Clash of Civilizations, in which he claimed that the 21st century will be shaped along battles and clashes would be more along the cultural fault lines instead of being primarily fashioned by national interest and economic interests. That gave rise to a lot of hate mongering as well as stereotyping in the media, in the public. Islam and Western countries and Western civilization, they were conceptualized as being in clash with one another. Now Huntington said that the new world order would be characterized by the fact that the greatest division among humankind and the dominating source of conflict will be culture. And the area of study that I have been interested in for the last 14 years and have been teaching language in a university in my country is language. That's my area of interest for the last 14 years, as I mentioned, and that is closely connected with culture. And that's why I am interested to see whether the conflict scenario that Huntington talks about and the increasing conflict, conflicts that we see around us in the post 9-11 era can they be conceptualized in terms of language? So I want to see what is the relationship between language and culture. On the one hand, it has been said that language is at the core of a culture, and Nietzsche even goes further. The German philosopher says, we live in a prison house of our language, by which he means that our worldview is fashioned by the kind of language that we are born into, which affects not only the way we see ourselves, but it also affects the way we see others. It has both potential as well as, uh, as well as hazards. So, relationship between language and culture. Language is obviously one of the distinguishing features of our species. It is what distinguish distinguishes us from the non-articulate kingdom. Language is the is, is central in giving us our identity. And as I mentioned before, it is a defining feature of, it defines and limits the range of our thinking and worldview. And this is indirectly in connection with identity. The way we see ourselves, the way we see others, that is how we form our identity. So this brings me to language and education. If there is a connection between language and culture, and language is, plays a significant part, it's the central, plays a central part in education. Language and education and culture, how can they be understood in terms of its effect upon the identities of those who learn a language? That's why I have taken two school systems in Pakistan, and I, in order to see, are we preparing the children in these schools for hatred or accommodation in the future? Because in the increasing era of mobility, international mobility, globe-trottering, globe and global possibility of flying across continents, there is both potential and danger for global harmony as well as global conflict. I have taken the dividing line between these two, two schools as English, because the, 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 lang the, the English language, it provides a kind of uh, ticket to upward so social mobility. It's the doorkeeper to upward social mobility. And it's because of that, apart from identity, that the tussle in a society, like in my country, arises. 
So I have taken these two schools, which are situated in my country, which is Pakistan, and I have conceptualized these two schools as promoting national and Islamic identity on the, on the one hand, because the country projects itself as an Islamic country, and the nation, the state, is usually is portrayed as synonymous with Islam in the political discourse as well as in the media. On the, and they are using local textbooks in these schools, the government schools, in order to instill a local Islamic identity in the children. On the other hand, there are the elite schools, which are giving uh, English medium instructions along the lines of British uh, school systems. And they are instilling more global identity and liberal identity in the students. And they are using books which are Oxford endorsed. Now, the education system in Pakistan, the education field, is a conflict zone. And a few glimpses, apart from many other, can be seen in the case of Malala Yousafzai when she was shot, when she was on her way home from her school in 2012. At that time, she was only 14. She was going to an English medium private school, and she had been advocating universal ed education for girls, and the Taliban threatened her. But as she said, we realize the importance of our voice when we are silenced. And they tried to silence her, but she didn't. She survived. She not only survived, but went on to collect the Nobel Prize for, pe for peace. Then another event happened in 2014. Religious extremists attacked an army-run school in the northern city of Peshawar. More than 130 children were killed. These are, these are tragic, but true stories. So my question is, the national and Islamic identity on the one hand, which is promoted by the hundreds and thousands of schools throughout the country. And on the other hand, the global and Western identity, which is so blatantly proclaimed and promoted by the private schools, which are also, if not in hundreds and thousands, at least in thousands throughout the country. What is it doing to the children? Where is the voice of the children? What do they think they get when they are in a foreign language class? So whether it is these children, who are studying in a private school, sitting in a cozy environment, or these children who are sitting on the floor in a government school. Both of these need to be heard. And I think their voices should be put together. The two schools have two ideologies. As I mentioned before, the government schools there have more Islamic ideology. Their English is taught as a foreign language. And the key, lang the key word is foreign here. What are these children getting? And what the teachers think that these children should become in the future? What is the conception of the teachers about their students? And what is the conception of these students about themselves in the future? So because of the social and cultural repercussions and importance of, of this topic, I have set my topic in a post-structuralist framework in order to see phenomenon of assimilation and resistance in these two schools and to place it in a post-colonial context. By assimilation, I mean acceptance of Western culture, teaching books to children which has Christmas, Snowfall, Santa Claus. And by resistance, I mean wiping everything out, teaching them about the mosque, about prayer, about local culture, but not telling them anything about the West. These are the two extremes. Now, I am using as my method, I'm using imagined communities, which is a concept, which is a construct proposed by Bonnie Norton, in order to see what these children want to become in the future and what is the effect of that imaginative flight upon their learning. So my methodology would be to take the data from the students and the teachers' interviews, analyze it in a critical discourse analysis in order to put it in the broader sociocultural context. I would also be using other sources of information. My research aim broadly are how culture and linguistic identities of the students are shaped in these two schools. What are their imagined communities when they are studying English as a foreign language? And what effect does it have on learning of English? In the meantime, Malala turned 18 the previous year. She's doing a lot of work in my country as well as another. And she opened 
a school for refugee girls in the Syrian refugee camps. While I dream, I dream, I dream of a just and equal education system for all children in my country. Thank you. Yeah, please. Um, I'm just, thank you, very interesting. Um, I'm just curious about what you've got on that side there. What does a just and equal education system mean to you? Oh. Uh, because I think that apart from the identity crisis that I'm going to focus on, this identity crisis is just a manifestation of a larger socioeconomic phenomena, which is which is structured along the class system in the, in, in the society. So the class system, it perpetuates itself in collusion or in agreement with the education system. The education system provides very little opportunity of good education to these children, and they have very little opportunity of getting quality teaching in English. And English in the country, in this country, is the key to access high paid jo high pay jobs, access high, po high positions in the military, in the bureaucracy, politicians, business, everywhere. You see, so these children, they, are not, they account for 92% of the population. The children to your right, they account for about 4 to 5%, while there are other schools that are in the middle, they account for 3 to 4%. So by just, I mean, why the edu education system is not being, being being harmonized in a way that every child, whether they are born to poor parents or to rich parents, they have equal chances. Thank you. Uh, the challenges are that on the one hand, these, the elite schools especially, they would not want themselves to be put in the same basket with the with the non-elite schools, because they, them, they think them, of themselves as you know, st symbol status. So at, at first, I, would, I, I had a, b a bit of, uh, of a challenge in convincing them that I am not a threat to them. I am not going to degrade their, their, their value in the society. I'm not going to degrade their prestige by putting them against a school, which to them is like nothing. And they would say, like, oh, you're going to place us against them, but we, we train our teachers and, 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 and uh, uh, Oxford certified t uh, trainers, they come to Islamabad and they train our teacher and you are placing against those schools. So I said, no, this is not my purpose. And I had to do quite some bit of convincing that I am here just as an observer. I am not here to judge. I'm just trying to find out what is happening and to present it. Thank you. Thank you. I think you have a question. Thank you. You mentioned about the difference between girls and schools versus private or elite schools. So the curriculum that these private schools have, mm. will they get any sort of girl in the or mm. they are just running a parallel education mm. system without any girl Yes, uh, that's, that's a key point. The, all the, 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 the proliferation of the private sector in the country, it is because of the lack of a clearly defined education policy in the country. So the education policy is in place. But if you read the document, by the end of reading the document you read to the last page, you get no sense of what they want people to do. There is so much scope for people to define it in their own way. And that is what they are taking advantage of. Some people are teaching Oxford in those books. Other people are printing their own books in the country. There is a government school system which is printing its own books. There are madrasas which are printing religious books. So this is all because of a lack of a clearly defined education policy. And this, you pointed it very well. This is a central concern for my research. 